Okay, well, thank you very much to the Lennox Gesto Foundation for asking me to speak uh, at this session, uh, this interesting session discussing advances in scientific understanding of Lennox Gesto syndrome. And I'll be speaking about network changes uh, that uh, contribute to the uh, syndrome. We'll be stepping through, uh, first of all, considering why networks are important and using the example of temporal lobe epilepsy, then going through the evidence that we and uh, others have, uh, uh, have found for the, the cortical networks underpinning LGS, considering how this intersects with the phenomenon of epileptic encephalopathy, and finally, uh, considering whether there may be one key network driving the process. So um, why do networks matter for epilepsy? Well, um, a, another example of network failure is a traffic jam. Uh, and that's a, that's, a, that's a network failure that we're all very familiar with. And as we all know, a traffic jam can be caused by many different things. It can be, if you'll excuse the pun, due to an iron channel uh, causing a, a puncture in a tyre deflation of the tyre, ultimately obstruction of a flow of cars, and then the phenomenon that we all recognise, which is a massive traffic jam. And in some ways, the traffic jam is best appreciated from a helicopter hovering over the city from a distant view. It's not particularly well appreciated by the zoomed-in view in the top left-hand corner. But, of course, the phenomenon of the traffic jam can be caused by many other uh, phenomena. It could be due to a, a flat battery. It could be that the bus has broken down. It could simply be due to the time of the day. It could be due to the fact that it's snowing or it's raining, or perhaps uh, it could be there's a bus strike and everyone has had to drive that day. So in summary, a whole range of different specific phenomena cause the same, uh, same expression of network failure. And uh, an interesting cor corollary of this is that the solution to this network failure is not necessarily to put a new tyre on every car every day, but rather is to put a new lane on the freeway. So network, solution network problems respond to network solutions. So why does it matter in epilepsy? Well, an example is uh, uh, the well-known phenomenon of temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, in this condition, patients experience uh, seizures uh, with early manifestations of deja vu, fear and an olfactory aura, uh, consistent with the predominant involvement of mesial, temporal and adjacent structures responsible for memory, emotion and smell. As seizures progress, they uh, spread into the adjacent uh, frontal opercular region and uh, patients may develop oral automatisms. And even between seizures, patients have static issues with their memory consistent with pervasive uh, damage, uh, damage or impairment of memory structures. The EEG shows spikes over the relevant region of the temporal lobe. Imaging may or may not show a structural abnormality in the medial temporal regions. And functional imaging such as PET shows hypometabolism in the, uh, in the temporal lobe consistent with its um, uh, it's uh, impaired function. Uh, consistent with this, uh, when uh, patients have a successful uh, operation to remove uh, the, part, the anterior part of the temporal lobe generating seizures, regions of the temporal lobe posterior to that, which of course have not been removed, show recovery, show improvement in PET metabolism, consistent with uh, recovery of the uh, adjacent uh, structures when the driving epileptic focus is removed. So coming back to our uh, analogy then, a network view of epilepsy helps explain the interictal and seizure semiology. It allows you to have a sensible discussion with the patient about their perception of the attacks and similarly with the carers about how they perceive uh, what they witness during seizures. It explains the pervasive disturbances of function and directs clinicians where to search uh, and potentially a guiding therapy. So networks matter. <laughs> 
Now, in this uh, audience, uh, I don't need to explain what Lennox Gesto syndrome is, but just to point out a couple of key factors, including that there are multiple different etiologies, all expressed in the same phenotype. And this, of course, has always been very mysterious and was one of the reasons that we uh, direct uh, we got interested in, in the uh, syndromes a number of years ago. About 30% will have a visible structure, uh, structural lesion, and, and, but a, and a large number have a known genetic abnormality, which may be monogenic or polygenic. And of course, there are the characteristic EEG features and seizures. So we, uh, uh, coming uh, at this condition from a network perspective, so the fact that you have the same electroclinical manifestations despite a range of specific causes always suggests to us that there must be a unifying uh, underlying epileptic network. And one way of studying this is with combined EEG and functional MRI. With this technology, the patient lies in the scanner we attach specific MR-compatible EEG electrodes, which in the image here you can see are fed out of the bore of the magnet into some form of relay or amplifier box and then out of the scanner. And this is, in fact, a very primitive uh, relay box that I built in my PhD about 20 years ago. Of course, it's a lot more sophisticated now. And some of our early studies uh, in this, uh, including this one led by Neil and Pele, a Canadian uh, neurologist who was working with us at the time, showed that we, when you look at some of the key epileptic phenomena of LGS, including bursts of generalised paroxysmal fast activity, you saw widespread activation of the brain consistent with the widespread bursting fast activity on the EEG, where in contrast during trains of generalised spike and wave with sharp slow activity on the EG, you saw a different pattern with uh, more prominent areas of cortical deactivation. Well, I've already told you that LGS can be caused by focal lesions in various locations and various types. So an obvious question is, uh, is are the... Uh, network, are the changes in brain activity the same when patients have a lesion or are they different? And here's one example of the patients in the study that we published in 2014, a group of six patients with lesions in various locations. This particular patient has a lesion here in the left frontal lobe, a focal cortical dysplasia, and the characteristic EEG pattern that we recognise with LGS. Here's the features of the other patients and the indications of the various lesions are shown. And what we found was that the, uh, on group analysis that there was indeed a shared pattern of activation uh, during uh, these patients despite the lesions in various locations. And we started to get a better view of which brain regions are involved. And whilst it looks like activation here in the top panel is sort of all over the place, in fact, if you look carefully, you can see that it actually spares primary somatosensory cortex, primary visual cortex, and indeed primary <laughs> auditory cortex. So activation is really in so-called association cortex, the so-called thinking areas of the brain. Um, so, so this led us to the idea that uh, we were seeing a so-called secondary network epilepsy. Now, another interesting phenomenon we observed in, uh, in three of the patients who became seizure-free, and this is an example of one of those, was an early post-operative EEG continued to show trains of spike wave activity, whereas a follow-up EEG a month later showed a resolution of these changes and indeed a speeding up of the background rhythms. So this suggested to us that the phenomena uh, uh, of, that the epileptic activity of lennox gastro syndrome was related to the lesion, but was not being driven blow by blow by the lesion. In other words, the lesion was contributing to the network instability that produced the widespread activation. But um, the, the, uh, when the lesion was removed, that allowed the network behaviour to gradually settle down to a more normal state. So what can we conclude from these early uh, studies? First of all, LGS is a mode of network failure. It represents electrical instability within intrinsic cognitive systems of the brain, 
that there are multiple ways of entering this abnormal mode of brain behaviour, including lesions in or near the, near the network and various other diffuse abnormalities, be they genetic, metabolic or even early childhood insults. It's also potentially reversible in some patients. And when, uh, when the causative lesion uh, uh, is removed, you see a winding down of the epileptic activity rather than the instantaneous cessation, consistent with the concept that the lesions are, co are chronically irritating these networks, shifting them into a pro-epileptic state, and their removal is associated with a gradual return uh, to, out of that epileptic state into a more normal pattern of brain network behaviour. Uh, and another, so we've then coined this term that uh, Lennox Gastaut syndrome can be conceptualised as a secondary uh, network epilepsy. And this then helps, I think, explain to patients and families uh, why uh, patients with LGS seem to have the same electroclinical phenotype. And that's because the epileptic manifestations of LGS reflect the networks being driven they reflect the network dysfunction rather than the specific underlying cause. So we then wanted to try and understand this pattern of network behaviour further and in some uh, further studies in a larger group of patients with lennox gastaut syndrome, uh, we compared the pattern of brain activation during bursts of generalised fast activity with the patterns of known major cognitive networks in the brain. Now, of course, the brain can be partitioned up into very, in numerous very small regions and columns of neurons, each of which have very specific functions. But the brain can also be conceptualised as working within major cognitive networks. And the, um, uh, the, the intrinsic uh, binding rhythms within these distributed, not distributed cognitive networks uh, help uh, promote and uh, maintain the function uh, of uh, maintain major cognitive functions. So some of the major networks are listed here. The uh, on the uh, left, the dorsal attention network is a uh, set of net is, is a network responsible for maintaining visual attention when something occurs in your visual field and you look and you attend attend to it, you activate the DAN. The anterior salience network is really, that, that's the sort of network you go to when you're concentrating or focusing. So this uh, network uh, uh, um, uh, allows the brain to attend to specific tasks. So this switches on when you're focusing intently on a task. The executive control network is really like a sort of working memory or RAM area of the brain. So this is a, a, when you're uh, taking in complex information, retaining it and manipulating it in your mind in order to come up with decisions. Uh, an example might be you're reading a book, you need to know the letter, the word, the sentence, the paragraph, the chapter, the context of the book, what time of the day it is. All this stuff is being held in your head as you read the story and the executive control network is kind of making sense of that whole story. And now another very important network is the so-called default mode network. This is an area of the brain which is being relatively poorly understood until fairly recently, but is in fact a place where we spend about half our life. It's the internal reflective mode of the brain where we go and cogitate to ourselves and reflect on the day. Now, in, uh, normally um, there is a sort of counterbalancing between, for example, the executive control network and the default mode network. You can't be both externally engaged and concentrating and internally reflective. And these two, uh, as one goes up, typically the other one goes down. But what we see in lennox gastaut syndrome is both of these networks are being driven simultaneously, a highly abnormal pattern of brain activation. Uh, subsequently, we've gone on to study a larger group of uh, patients and including a series of children to, to ask the question, are these patterns of brain activity stable from the onset of the process uh, of LGS or do they evolve over time? <laughs> 
And the short answer is that uh, you can see the same pattern of activation whether you study young children with recent onset LGS or young adults with established LGS. Now, there are some minor differences seen here, but these are probably accounted for by the fact that we had to do uh, anaesthetised EEG fMRI in some of the, in uh, these young children for, um, for them to keep still in the scanner. But once again, we see the same pattern of activation, uh, including in these uh, widespread cortical areas, sparing primary cortical areas, also involving the medial thalamic structures and a region in the brainstem reticular formation. So um, we're also able to analyse the uh, EEG fMRI and ask was there one brain region that seemed to be driving the process? And we used a technique known as dynamic causal modelling, comparing the uh, onset of uh, fMRI activation in the cortex to the thalamus and the brainstem to see uh, which of these seemed to be driving the problem. And the short answer is it appeared that the cortical regions were driving the phenomena, the, uh, these bursts of generalised paroxysmal fast activity, which, as we know, uh, show a lot of similarity with the onset of tonic seizures. Uh, we've subsequently uh, uh, also, uh, as part of the Estelle study of deep brain stimulation for uh, LGS, uh, and I'll be describing that very briefly a little later on, as part of the Estelle study, we did simultaneous recordings from within the thalamus at the same time as uh, the scalp and confirmed there there was about a 100 millisecond lag between the onset of activity in the cortex and it appearing in the thalamus. So this has allowed us to postulate this model uh, uh, that the epileptic activity is cortically driven. It then likely propagates to the brainstem via uh, um, uh, primitive uh, sort of attentional pathways that we all have uh, and is then amplified, then radiates back up through the th uh, thalamus, which sort of unifies and amplifies the epileptic uh, circuit to generate these widespread discharges that we see at the scalp. And this, this model would, of course, be consistent with the fact that cortical lesions can generate an LGS phenotype and their removal can lead to gradual abolition of the epileptic process. I want to now talk about uh, epileptic encephalopathy. Uh, so epileptic encephalopathy is a process by w is, is a, a process whereby recurrent epileptic discharges in the brain seem to impair uh, brain development. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it is really a key component of Lennox Gasto syndrome. And you might, uh, I, you might say that given we've observed the involvement of epileptic discharges in these key cognitive networks, it is perhaps to be expected. As well as the early uh, deterioration that is uh, sadly uh, often seen early in the process of LGS, there's also some evidence of, uh, of progressive uh, intellectual issues in these patients uh, over time, including in this study uh, of a group of LGS children uh, monitored for more than 10 years. So we wanted to ask that uh, ask the question, sure, when there's epileptic activity, it involves these cognitive networks, but what about when the epileptic activity is not there? Is there a pervasive disruption of these cognitive networks? One way of doing this is to use a technique known as uh, fMRI functional connectivity, and I'll just briefly describe that so the next few slides make more sense. In short, you acquire a constant series of uh, functional MRI images, which are, in a sense, capturing the, uh, the baseline activity of the brain. We then interrogate a particular region and look at the time course of the fMRI signal, representing what that brain uh, region is doing over time. And we then compare that voxel or that region with every other uh, region in the brain to see which brain regions are following the same time course. And those that do are uh, shown uh, in uh, orange-red, um, meaning that there is a statistically significant correlation in the time course between that region and the seed region. In other words, 
the regions are functionally connected. Now, functional connectivity has been shown to reveal key networks in the brain, for example, the sensory motor system, uh, in this, with the same clarity uh, as when people are doing an actual functional activation task. So it's a very uh, useful tool to understand, understanding, uh, resting, uh, to understanding key brain networks. So this is uh, one of our uh, uh, papers from a couple of years ago now where we compared uh, in adult patients with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome what was the pattern of brain activity in these key networks that I've already shown you before uh, compared to patients with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And this is a connectivity matrix. And if we just focus on the left side of the image, this is the normal pattern where patients show, for example, in the default mode network, uh, red colours here representing uh, strong coactivation within the default mode network. And, for example, uh, over here, uh, counteractivation with the anterior salience network. As I discussed previously, patients cannot really be simultaneously uh, internally reflective and externally engaged. It's sort of one or the other. In contrast, in patients with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, we see quite a different pattern of uh, brain network behaviour. There's a simplification of the overall interaction between networks. It's like one big smudgy uh, blob rather than the, the system being broken up into its discrete networks. So in summary, what we saw was reduced integration within networks. In other words, within the network, the, the performance was not as good as it should be. And between networks, we weren't seeing such strong uh, counter fluctuation. So in summary, reduced within network integration and impaired between network segregation. Well, the next question is, all right, so we've shown, perhaps not surprising, that there's impaired performance in these cognitive networks. Uh, even when patients are not having bursts of epileptic activity. But, what a, a, but, but is this reversible? In other words, is epileptic encephalopathy potentially reversible in Lennox-Gastaut syndrome? And to ask this question, we were fortunate to be able to study a, a child who uh, had been operated on uh, in the Royal Children's Hospital under Simon Harvey and his team there. And we had access to some functional MR imaging uh, early on, including EEG fMRI, confirming the usual pattern of activation during bursts of generalised fast activity. Uh, and we also then had access to follow-up imaging a couple of years later after they'd had surgery, removal of the lesion and normalisation of the EEG. So what we did here is we compared this uh, child and the, the, the reason uh, we had to do it this way is these were anaesthetised studies, so we had to compare to other anaesthetised study. So this is, again, an activation uh, matrix uh, comparing uh, the net, same brain networks we discussed previously, this time broken up into smaller groups, but essentially it's the same thing. And what we see is both in this child with Lennox Gasto as an individual and in a group of other uh, children with LGS, this, uh, this sort of uh, abnormal, simplified, blob-like pattern of br interaction between brain networks. When the child had their operation and they were studied several years later, there was a return to a much more normal pattern of brain activity with strong co-activation within key networks and counter-activation with uh, um, adjacent networks. And we quantified this in a, a number of uh, the measures confirming this is closer to the normal pattern of brain behaviour. So in summary, following successful treatment of epilepsy, not only can you abolish the epileptiform discharges, but in some individuals we may uh, see a return to normal patterns of brain activity, and hence epileptic encephalopathy may be, in some people, uh, treatable. So... Um, I now, now want to turn to the uh, question as to whether there is a key network driving the whole epileptic process. We see widespread activation, but is it one of these key networks the key, uh, you know, primarily responsible? Because if it is, that then might provide a target for where we should be focusing our therapies. 
And to do this, um, uh, I'm just going to show you results for a number of different uh, multimodal Im uh, imaging studies we've done over the years. This is uh, one by Archery in Soma, a Thai epilepsy fellow who worked with us a number of years ago using ictal spec scans. This is a radio tracer you inject uh, at the time of seizures and then subsequently take the patient down for scanning and it shows which brain areas showed maximal uh, blood flow and activation during the seizure. And what we see is involved uh, increased blood flow here in the parietal, the frontal and parietal regions and reduced activity in pericentral cortex, as well as some activity here down in the brainstem. More recently, we've done a study of uh, a PET study uh, in conjunction with Tom Balfrod, a fellow who uh, was working with us from Belgium for 12 months. And I alluded earlier on in the slide about temporal lobe epilepsy to the fact that in patients with epilepsy, when they're not having seizures, you see reduced activity in brain regions um, maximally involved in the epileptic process. So we see hypometabolism, perhaps reflecting damage or abnormal function or maybe even an attempt of the brain to suppress epilepsy in those regions. And in short, in uh, this that PET study of LGS, we show the same regions of increased activity, of abnormal uh, activity in the frontal and parietal regions. So we're now starting to get a sense of a converging evidence here. Here's the uh, image of the uh, frontoparietal activation during the tonic seizures of LGS with its associated sustained burst of low voltage fast activity. Uh, here is some of our work looking at uh, brain changes during bursts of generalised paroxysmal fast activity, one of the key signatures of LGS, again, frontoparietal activation, sparing the, the pericentral cortex. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's a result from the PET uh, hypometabolism confirming the same regions. And here's another uh, body of work which we're in the process of publishing, looking at which brain areas show maximally abnormal fMRI uh, connectivity. In other words, which brain networks are maximally abnormal in LGS. We're starting to see a recurring theme. And I now want to just point out one other uh, piece of information and allude to the, start, the Estelle study, which we've recently completed and uh, is currently uh, uh, under review. We're hoping to have published by the end of the year. This is a study of 20 patients who've received uh, bilateral thalamic uh, stimulators to the central median nucleus. Uh, and uh, this has been... Uh, 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 um, led by Linda Dalek, a PhD student and neurologist working with me, as well as Christian Bullis, who's the neurosurgeon, who, as you can see very accurately, was able to implant the electrodes in all of the patients. So uh, Aaron Warren, uh, uh, postdoc working with me, who's actually had some of his funding from the Lennox Gesto Foundation, uh, and thank you very much for that, um, Aaron has then gone back and looked at the patients who've responded and compared the uh, location of uh, the uh, active electrode and where it projects to in the brain. So what we see is that in patients who've responded better to the brain stimulator, the brain the region of the thalamus that they were stimulated in connects most strongly to this same frontal, uh, frontal region. So I think we're starting to get a sense that across multiple uh, modalities, it's really this frontoparietal network that's driving the key um, mechanism in LGS, and possibly this posterior frontal region here being even more uh, being even more uh, a key node of that epilepsy network. So, in summary, then. Uh, we consider Lennox Gasto syndrome as a secondary network epilepsy with multiple varying causes, but the epileptic phenomena are expressed in a common network, and hence there are these recognisable features. The epilepsy activity enters into and is amplified through intrinsic cognitive systems. Uh, it is driven from the cortex and is potentially reversible if you can identify a discrete focal cause.
uh, is potentially reversible. The phenomena of epileptic encephalopathy uh, reflects the fact that it is cognitive networks that are being recurrently recruited by epileptic activity. But even between those discharges, you see abnormal interactions both within and between those cognitive networks. But once again, this is potentially reversible if the epileptic process can be halted, although the age and timing of that is, of course, uh, to be clarified. I've shown a wide range of cognitive networks are involved, but I think we're starting to get the sense that the frontoparietal network, otherwise known as the executive control network, may well be the key uh, uh, network. This network is responsible for sustained attention, complex problem solving and working memory. And again, this would probably, this does align well with some of the key cognitive issues experienced by patients with LGS, but it does uh, suggest to us a potential therapeutic target. So I'm, uh, I'd like to finish with that and acknowledge the numerous people who've helped me uh, over the uh, last few years, including uh, Aaron Warren, uh, Linda and Annie Roten, who was our trial coordinator and is now head of the EEG laboratory. Christian uh, Bullis, neurosurgeon. Wesley Thesevathan is a DBS neurologist who helped us get uh, uh, our experience up in DBS as well as uh, other names mentioned here, both at the Flory uh, Institute for Neuroscience and the Royal Children's Hospital. Thanks very much.